Now, if you'll look with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we'll begin reading in this prayer of the Apostle Paul recorded for us in verse 2 and all the way to the end of the chapter. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you <coughs> received the word, <coughs> for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The grass withers, the flower fades, God's word abides forever. By his grace and mercy, may his word be preached for you. Please be seated. Today is a very appropriate day for this sermon in our ministry theme focus of the lifestyle of evangelism and discipleship. Because the day gives me an opportunity to speak of a great challenge. A great challenge for every Christian and every church that wants to be faithful to Christ. A great challenge. Now, let me try to explain this. It's this not our only challenge, but it is a great challenge. Let me try to explain it the best, the best I can. One of the great challenges is, as you and I live for Jesus Christ, there are multiple responsibilities and multiple challenges in life. We live in a broken world, and the brokenness of this world is constantly being brought to us that we need to respond to it, and it's right that we respond to it. But we always have to be careful to keep the main thing the main thing. There are many necessary things. There are many good things that we need to respond to and do. But we can never, never lose keeping the main thing the main thing. And that takes quite a bit of a challenge. We're right in the middle of it today, for instance. There is a significant issue we need to deal with as the people of God. In our culture, it has embraced death. The culture itself is in a death spiral because it's a culture of death. That's why we take the time to deal with the sanctity of life and bring attention to it on a Lord's Day, but yet throughout the year with various ministries engaged continually in multiple issues. And the sanctity of life has multiple issues, doesn't it? Women in crisis pregnancy being told a lie as to the answer. Children, made in the image of God, and the gift of life in the most defenseless place of all, the womb. Fathers, fathers who need to be challenged, children that need to be adopted. There are a doctors, a medical community that needs, to be, that needs to be confronted with embracing something that is in opposition to everything the calling of a doctor is. A government that has invested itself in it, the cultural elite that promote it, how they are to be met head on with humility yet courage, with truth and love. Yet, the church of Jesus Christ does not exist for the sanctity of life. It certainly addresses it. It certainly responds to it. 
The church of Jesus Christ and every Christian who has been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ will always be faced with many varied and multiple challenges that we are to respond to. When the culture brings it, then we're to respond to it. Yet we are the ones that know. Not only do we need to keep the main thing the main thing, to really deal with the issues, you've got to deal with the main thing. And the heart of the problem is the problem with the heart. And the only thing that deals with the heart ultimately is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me just simply say I am so grateful. I am absolutely so grateful for the ministry partners that you met. And I do want to encourage you to go back there and talk to them. To encourage them and to learn from them. And to talk with them. And I'm grateful for them. But you know what I'm grateful for? Whether it's the adoption ministry, the physician's ministry, the women's crisis pregnancy ministry, the, um, uh, the abortion recovery ministry. It doesn't matter which one. It was. Everyone you talk to, one of the reasons we love to work with them is not only do they become an instrument to go into that particular area, but they are keeping the main thing, the main thing. You even heard it in the testimony, didn't you? The main thing is the heart, the souls, and the eternity of everyone that we're dealing with. And the real problem of why we have to deal with this is it's a heart issue. The soul of a nation and the heart of a nation, which is the soul of a people and the heart of a people. And that's why we have to keep the main thing, the main thing. We have to stay on mission. And good and necessary ministries cannot become the mission. You have to stay on mission to stay on message to stay in ministry. It is absolutely crucial to do that. As I said, there are multiple things that we do. And one of the reasons why this is important is ultimately whatever a church or a Christian sees as its mission will ultimately affect its message. Ultimately, it will control the message. For instance, if we rightly see some of the issues in our age, they're amazing. Right now, the sanctity of life, the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of, of the family, the sanctity of sexuality, the sanctity of gender, the sanctity of uh, the issue of, of racism, that we're actually made of one race, Adam and Eve, with celebrating multiple ethnicities. Even as we consider that in light of the next holiday of Martin Luther King uh, that's coming up. All of those things that are before us, that face us, those things need to be addressed. But the church cannot make social issues and social justice its mission. If it does, it will soon embrace a social gospel. That doesn't mean it doesn't address those issues. But we, are, we don't exist for the issues of social justice. We exist for the sake of the gospel, which speaks to those, because when you disciple people, those issues have to be dealt with and must be dealt with. But they are dealt with from the focus of the gospel in evangelism and discipleship. I want you to know the joy of achievement and success as defined in the Word of God. But if I make the mission of my ministry and the mission of Briarwood your success, it's not long till we've got a prosperity gospel instead of a biblical gospel. I want you to see yourself appropriately made in the image of God. But if we make self-esteem the focus of our ministry and our mission, it's not long till our message becomes a, becomes a therapy gospel. I believe the issues of a nation must be addressed from a biblical world and life view. But if we see that, that the, the, the mission of the church is, the, is, the, um, is that it becomes a political pawn and a political player, it's not long till the gospel gets wrapped up in the flag of the nation where that church exists instead of speaking to it. We must always maintain the mission because if, you, if the mission creeps, the message will become adulterated. 
Again, hear me. I am not saying that the issues are not addressed. They must be. But they must be addressed from our message, which is, which is embracing our mission. Now, last week we talked about it. May I remind you what we talked about last week? What is our mission? We have a God-given mandate. This is the mission. We have multiple consequences. We have multiple issues to deal with. All of those things that the church is called to do and to respond to. But our mandate from the Lord is very clear and it's given to us in every gospel and it's given to us throughout the scripture and it's this. Our God-given mandate is to speak our God-given message to fulfill our God-given mission which is make disciples. All authority has been given to me and in heaven and on earth. Go there for and make disciples of all the nations. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the othermost part of the world. Go and make disciples. So that's why one of the reasons we have embraced this as a ministry theme this year, that we're going to be on mission, to be on message, and in ministry. In ministry in all of the areas mentioned, but those are ministries from the mission. And what is the mission? The mission is to take the message, the gospel, and with a lifestyle of evangelism and discipleship. And many of you Thankfully, in listening through it, thinking through it, came to me and said, Pastor, wait just a minute. Why don't you just say lifestyle evangelism and discipleship? And here's the reason why. The reason why is your lifestyle doesn't evangelize. Our lifestyle can open the door for evangelism. Our lifestyle can close the door for evangelism. Our lifestyle can undercut or enhance our evangelism. But nobody's going to heaven because they admire the way you live. They go to heaven with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior by faith. And faith comes by hearing. By hearing the word of Christ. So what we're actually saying is a lifestyle that the lifestyle doesn't evangelize. The lifestyle is we're evangelizing. And the lifestyle is we're discipling. We are discipled. We are disciples. We are followers of Christ. We are learners. We are teaching. We are learning. We are being discipled, and we are discipling others. It is a lifestyle. Evangelism, the way I tried to sum it up was I said, E to the fifth power. Everyone evangelizing, everybody, everywhere, every day. And we tried to substantiate that in Scripture, but let me just take just a moment with it. Everyone, every one of us are called to share the gospel if you know Jesus Christ. If you don't know Christ, you're a mission field. If you do know Christ, you're now a missionary. You're now sharing the gospel, every one of us. Now, having said that, every, some of you are unbelievably gifted evangelists, and I praise the Lord for you. But every one of us are to evangelize. By the way, that's true with so many things in the Scripture. Some people are gifted to worship, and they help us. But we're all supposed to worship. Some people are gifted in prayer, but we all pray. Some people are gifted disciplers, but we all disciple. So there are, and one of the areas where we all engage, although some are gifted, is evangelism. Every one of us that know Christ are to evangelize, evangelize a verbal communication of the gospel. Everyone evangelizes everybody, every, uh, everybody that we, in fact, see every, I don't care whether they're rich, I don't care if they're rich, if they're poor, I don't care if they're, um, what color they are, what origin nationally that they, it does not matter. All the sons of Adam need to hear the message. Jesus Christ loves you, died for your sins, and has paid the penalty for your sins. And if you come to him, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. He receives you just as you are. He never leaves you just as you are. He forgives you. He clothes you with his righteousness. His spirit is poured out within you, and you become a new creation in Jesus Christ. Every 
everybody needs to hear that. Up and inners, down and outers. The up and inners are finding out it doesn't really make my life. The down and outers need to be warned. It's not the life of the up and inner that will make your life. It is Jesus Christ who is your life. Everyone evangelizing, everybody, everywhere. Evangelism is not something we just do at church on a Sunday. It's not something we just do when we gather. It's something we do when we scatter personally. Personal evangelism, everyone evangelizing, everybody, everywhere, the fraternity, the team, the classroom, the office, the neighborhood. Harry, how do you do that? I am so glad you asked me the question how to do that. And if you will come tonight, I will talk to you about how to do it. Bridge building to bring people to the bridge to life and personal evangelism. Every day. It's not something we just do on Sundays or Fridays. It's every day. Now, folks, listen, I am fully aware that I, this, when I say every day, I don't mean that you lay down at 9.30 and say, oh, I did not share the gospel with somebody today and get up and go out in the street, hunt somebody down on the corner and say, listen, I got to share the gospel with you today. I'm not. I'm just talking about every day, always sensitive, always ready. What are those divine appointments? What are those opportunities to start building the bridge, to build the bridge, to plant the seed, to water the seed, to cultivate the seed, to weed around the seed? Every day, you're always looking at that day as God who are you going to bring and what moment can I talk to them about the most important decision they will ever make in their life? What will they do with Jesus? That's everyone evangelizing everybody, everywhere, every day. And then discipleship, a lifestyle of discipleship, meaning getting our life on a life, life on life, life to life. And notice I've put something else there, life to lives. Because the most productive way of discipling is a disciple with a small group because they get the benefits of each other horizontally as well as the one-on-one. -on -one. Now, there's time for one-on-one, -on -one, life to life, life on life. There's time that you do that just one-on-one -on -one for a season or a reason. But you'll notice Jesus gave most of his time to 3, 12, and 70. That's where we are getting the horizontal dynamic is working so that I'm, I can lead a group and I need to be in a group as a lifestyle discipleship. Now, how would you like for the, you remember, do you remember last week we started to unfold this by coming to a moment about less than 25 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension, and all the way in Europe, the gospel in Acts 1 through 8 had gone to Jerusalem and shaken Jerusalem. It had gone to Judea and Samaria, Acts 9 through 12, and shook Judea and Samaria. And then in Acts 13, it goes to the world. And then you get to Acts 17 and verse 6, and remember 13 words. I'd love to hear again. These people who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Where was it they said that? Where, where, where it was, a, it, this was not a paid for celebrity endorsement of Christianity. This was the utterance of an adversary, a pagan in Europe. The gospel had gotten all the way to Europe and all the way in Europe, they were now responding. And where was that exact place where he spoke? These people who have turned the world upside down have come here also referring to the Apostle Paul. Where was the exact place? Does anyone remember? I'm sure you do. You just kind of miss it for the moment. It was a place called Thessalonia. Wouldn't you love to know what Paul's got to say to us about that? So what happened in Acts 17 is followed up six months after that. Six months after that statement's made. Paul is down in Corinth, and the people up at Thessalonia, it's unbelievable what's happening. They're under persecution, and the gospel is spreading. So they write to Paul, and they say to Paul, Paul, we need some help, and they have some questions. So he writes a letter back to them, and he writes a letter back. The year is 50 A.D., and it's six months after he had arrived in Thessalonia and shook Europe and the world with the gospel. 
And now they write back to him, and he is writing back to them, and he, re he writes back what I just read to you. And he writes 1 Thessalonians. And Thessalonians, like almost all of other epistles, start off with a prayer of thanksgiving. May I give you one of the books that has had one of the, I have about five books that I like to recommend on prayer. And one of the most important in my life was written by a Baptist pastor by the name of A.W. Pink. And he wrote a book called Gleanings from the Prayers of the Apostle Paul. There are 17 prayers of the Apostle Paul. This is one of them that are recorded in the epistles. Prayers that he, that he uttered and were recorded under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And this is one of them. And here he said, we give thanks for y'all. That's what he said, y'all. We give thanks for y'all. All in fact, he said, we give thanks for all y'all. And he said, there are three reasons why I'm giving thanks for you. I'm giving thanks for you for three reasons. Can I give you the third one that he gives? The third one is absolutely astounding. He says, you know one of the reasons I give thanks for you? Because the gospel that came to you in word and in power has had such an impact in your life, and you have turned from your idols to serve the true and living God that everywhere I go in Macedonia and Achaia, I don't even have to set up the ministry. They come asking me about Jesus because they heard about what happened to you. He said, I don't have to do any preliminary work. They come saying, hey, can you tell us about Jesus Christ and the gospel because we have heard what it did in Thessalonia? He says, so I give thanks. You're making my job a lot easier. But the first thing he gives thanks for, he does it all the time in the epistles. He gives thanks for the triad of Christian virtues. Now, what are they? Well, you know what they are. You'll find them in 1 Corinthians You'll find them in chapter 13. They are faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. Constantly in his prayers, he reverts back to them. Notice what he says. Look with me. I give thanks to God for you because of your, look at verse, look at verse 3. Remembering before God and our Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he gives a, another reason. So he has three reasons. You made my job easier. The testimony of what's happened to you has opened doors for me. Number two, I, no, but the first reason is I'm so grateful for your changed life it, that's shown up in faith, hope, and love at work in your life and at work from your life. But he said, let me give you another reason why. I give thanks because I know God has elected you. What? Now wait, Harry. The doctrine of election is a sovereign God, a triune God has sovereignly elected his people from all eternity. Well, how in the world can you know who the elect are? They don't have an E on their forehead. How do you know? But that's what he says. Look at the next verse. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has, and it's in, the, it's in the noun form, elected you. It's translated for verbal uh, reading, chosen you. This word elect, the concept is all over the Bible, but the word itself shows up five times, one here and four times in the book of Romans. And here, when he gives it, he says, I know God has elected you. Why? Well, Paul, you weren't there in the councils of the Trinity before the foundation of the world. You were not there in the establishment of the covenant of grace, whereby Jesus is going to redeem all that the Father gives to him. You weren't there. How do you know? And they don't have an E on their forehead. How do you know? He said, here's how I know, because the marks of God's electing grace is on them. And he gives three of these marks. He says this, for we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. That when the gospel came to you, it came in word. But it didn't come in word only. Now, don't read that as diminishing the fact that it came in word. It did come in word. It has to come in word because faith comes by hearing. But it didn't come just in word only. It came in, the word came in power. Why? The power of the Holy Spirit. How? With full conviction. 
That's why I know. You see, because when God's electing grace is in place, his son goes to the cross to pay for all the sins of all of his people for all of eternity. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justified. Who will bring a who will bring condemnation? It is Christ who died, yes, rather, who is raised again. Not only are the elect redeemed at the cross, Father, all whom you've given me, I lose not one. But the elect are searched out by the power of the Holy Spirit with the gospel. I love the way one Baptist pastor, I'm quoting a lot of Baptists today, but that's okay. I love the way one Baptist pastor said it. He said, Jesus went to the cross and with his blood he redeemed all of his people and will lose none. Then he ascended to heaven and from the throne he sent the bloodhound of heaven to go track them all down. And the Holy Spirit has sniffed you out with the gospel and has come to you with power and full conviction. So the gospel wasn't a word only enterprise but it went to your heart, and the heart was changed. That's the evidence of God's electing grace. Then, then he says, then you became, not only was there a lifestyle of evangelism, but he had a lifestyle of discipleship, because when you responded, what did we do? We started discipling you, and you became imitators of us. You see, that's what discipleship is. You model you mentor, and you motivate. We set an example, we mentored you, and we were there to encourage you, to motivate you in the Lord. That's what Paul did, evangelism, a lifestyle of evangelism and discipleship. So here's our takeaway, and let me just ask you to walk away with this. There's so much here, and, but I just know I get another shot at you next week, Lord willing, Okay. So let me just stop here with this takeaway for you. Here's the takeaway I want you to think about. What is, oh wait, I want to ask your permission. No, I'm not going to ask your permission. I want to ask your patience. I am going to, Lord willing, dig deep into this matter of the lifestyle of discipleship. Right now, this January, particularly anticipating missions conference, I want to dig down a little deeper with you in this matter of a lifestyle of evangelism. Building bridges, that's why I'm doing Sunday night, to bring people to the bridge to life verbally. But I think a good way to start, and we'll set up tonight and these evening studies on bridge building, and um, is to maybe give you this. I'm gonna give you a definition of evangelism. Now let me confess one more thing. This is not a bumper sticker definition. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Unless you got a big car, if this is a bumper sticker uh, definition. Now, I can give you those, and I'm going to refer to bumper sticker definition. I love the, the founder of the Salvation Army, um, uh, General Booth's um, statement. Uh, he said, evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. <laughs> That's great. So, there are those, and I'm, but this is my discipling definition of evangelism. So let me give it to you, have you a brief walk through in a few moments for just a few minutes, and then we'll close in prayer. It is a divinely authorized evangelism, is a divinely authorized verbal communication of the gospel, summoning or calling any and all to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior with spirit-filled power, persuasion, and purpose. It is a divinely authorized, I sure hope you were here last Sunday night to hear Bobby's, um, uh, Bobby's uh, talk, and I love one of the ma- points that he made. There's a lot of things that describe us as evangelists. We're servants, we're stewards. There's all kind of word pictures, but I love this one. Second Corinthians 5, you are ambassadors for Christ. You have the full credential. And this is what Jesus said. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go and make disciples of all the nations. You are a divinely authorized communicator 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The triune God has authorized it. The triune God is with you by the Spirit sent by Jesus because of the love of the Father that sinners might be right with God. A divinely authorized, notice, verbal commitment that you are actually sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ verbally, that you are communicating it verbally. Now, sometimes you're planting it, the seed. Sometimes you're watering the seed. Sometimes you're... Folks, let me just say this. I have never yet prayed with someone who came to Jesus that the moment that I talked with them and prayed with them was the first time they'd ever heard about the gospel. Somebody had gone before me. Somebody had planted, somebody had watered, somebody had cultivated. But it is enga- but you're engaged in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. You're engaged in sharing the gospel. And you're calling them to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because you are calling him, you're calling them to put their trust in him that on the cross... Jesus took your place and paid for all of your sins and is risen victorious. Therefore, you can have the gift, not because this is free, but because it's paid for. And now he gives it to you freely. Come just as you are. But you never stay just as you are because when you come to him, you come to follow him. See, we think you lead people to Christ with the gospel message of evangelism. And later on, you try to talk them into following Jesus. That's not the way. Jesus always put it together. Come, follow me. And the Bible puts it together. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, you surrender. Savior, you put all your trust in him. That he is the redeemer of your sins. That you will come to him, any and all will come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And you come with the power of the Spirit. Did you know you got three power packs at work in your life as an evangelist. Three power packs. This last year, this last week, I mean, this last Christmas, I don't even know what time it is. This last Christmas, my, uh, yes, I know it's two minutes after. We're about through. I know that time. But let me, let me just say, this last Christmas, I got one of those carry-around power packs for your phone. And, I mean, my kids went and grandchildren went crazy over it. And I said, hey, I got some power packs. The power of prevailing prayer. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God. And you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who empowers you so that you speak and they hear with full conviction. The power of the Holy Spirit at work that causes you to be passionate and compassionate. That causes you to be humble and to be bold. And only he can do that in your life with power. So I want to say something, and this is how I'll close with you on personal evangelism. I am not talking about preaching evangelism. But I am talking about personal evangelism. And this is what I want to say about personal evangelism. It's personal. There's three persons involved. Three persons. The person you're talking to, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Well, Harry, what about me? Oh, you're just, you're just the instrument. It's not about us. We deal with people as people not targets. They're people with hurts. That's why we ask a lot of questions to find out where they're hurting. We don't step in giving answers. We step in giving questions. And as we step in giving questions, to point them to Christ, the person of Christ, not to us, we deal with people as people. And it's the person of the Holy Spirit as we deal with these persons that allows us to bring them to the personal relationship with Christ. So in personal evangelism, be personal. 
be personal. That's what God has called us to do in a lifestyle of evangelism and discipleship. That's why I'll say this. The strength and power, persuasion, and integrity. Now, don't, have, don't try to write this down. I'll give it to you later. The strength, the power, the persuasion, and the integrity of your words conversationally to someone with the gospel. The effectiveness of that is usually directly related and proportionate to the strength, the power, the persuasion, and the integrity of your relationship with them. The power of your words to them through the Spirit of God is usually directly proportionate to the power of your relationship with them. When the power of the Holy Spirit gives you love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, they're going to experience that. And that's what God uses to make you effective in communicating with them. We're not going to have powerful words without powerful relationships and personal evangelism. Now, that's normally. Now, I'm not talking about in every. Listen, if I'm in an airplane, we're going down. I don't have time to get to be their best friend. But going down in that airplane is going to make my words pretty significant when we're talking. So sometimes the situation will just give the importance to it. But most of the time in personal evangelism, You can't have personal evangelism until you deal with people personally. With integrity, with power, and with carefulness and courageous compassion. And oh, how I long to see abortionists stop aborting babies and get converted. Oh, how I long to see staff that fill abortuaries get converted. Women who find the hope of Christ to deal with the challenges of crisis. Homes that are lighthouses of the gospel for children to be adopted. Fathers who can actually be a man because they become men of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we got to keep the main thing the main thing. So you go to that fraternity, that team, that classroom, that business, that neighborhood, personally, to people, by the person of the Spirit, to introduce them to the lover of their soul, the person of Jesus Christ who died on the cross. Would you give me one more minute, a minute and a half? His name was Frank. With my wife, when we were in Charlotte, he was one of the sidewalk advocates. We had the privilege to close down two abortuaries in Charlotte in the 1990s. And he was a part of it. And all he was was an insurance salesman. But he also played an instrument in the orchestra at the church. And he loved Jesus. I had had the privilege to speak to his insurance company. And I snuck in the back door to move them from insurance to assurance. And he became a Christian. Joined the church. Became concerned about the sanctity of life. But he kept the main thing, the main thing. So when the young lady came up by him on the sidewalk, and she said to him, you don't understand. He said, I probably don't, but I would love to. Would you talk with me? And she did. And he heard from her what made it a crisis. And much of it was ostracism and financial. And with his wife, he said, would you come live with us? And then he said, there's a doctor at our church I want to introduce you to. He'll take care of you. When you go to the hospital, don't worry. I'll take care of that. 
Not only was a baby saved, that young lady became a believer. She was saved for all eternity. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Everybody evangelizing. Everyone, everywhere, every day. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the privilege to be together with your people this Lord's Day. Thank you, Father, for those who have labored so diligently in this matter of the sanctity of life. And thank you, God, that as we deal with this, we can talk about what is life, that Jesus Christ is our life, Lord and Savior. Not just an add-on, not just someone that we talk about every once in a while in church every once in a while. But he's our Lord. He's our Savior. For us to live is Christ. To die is gain. But here, we have many challenges. Many opportunities. Help us to embrace them and never shrink back from them nor be silent. Yet, help us stay on mission. On message. And in ministry. Today, you may be here, and when you heard these people being introduced, you said, I need to talk to someone about that abortion recovery. I need to talk to someone about these ministries. In fact, I just need to pray with someone. There's a prayer team to my left. Very personally and confidentially, they'll meet with you. Just step over there with them. Today, you've come and you've heard that there's a Savior who loves you who gave himself for you. Do not walk away from this place and walk away from him. While you came to this place, we would love to tell you about him and would love to do that personally, that you might have everlasting life. Now, Father, your people have gathered to worship you. We now scatter as we scatter. I ask that every one of us will evangelize every day, everybody, everywhere. All because we love you. And we love these people. People need the Lord. Help us to go with words. But not words only. Words in the power of the Holy Spirit with full conviction. In Jesus' name, amen.